we're going to move on to a brief overview of the first global challenge. And so for the first global challenge, teams were tasks of building a robot, which is just a little bit bigger than an FTC robot. And they were given a kit of only rev parts and were only allowed to use the parts in that kit. The game is a three on three game, similar to like FRC in that sense. And so now let's take a look at uh, the game video that they released to get a little bit more insight on how the teams actually had to score points. Yeah, so the game game video is called Ocean Opportunities. And so you can see that there are many different parts to the field with the main scoring elements being these macro pollutants, which are big volleyballs and micro pollutants being small volleyballs. Yeah, when I first saw this game, I thought it was I thought it was a little similar to a little combination between Velocity Vortex and uh, Rover Ruckus recently, uh, because you're scoring these these multiple balls and uh, bigger balls into a middle container as well as uh, two so two um, cor two containers in the sides. Um, so yeah. yeah. So at the beginning of the game, the all of the balls, which are called pollutants, are released onto the field. And there are multiple different places for them to go. So you can see there were corner zones, which are called uh, reduction pro processing hubs, I believe. And those um, are worth one point each for every ball pushed in them. And you can load those with your human player into the robot as long as the robot is touching the, the perimeter. Then there is the center structure with the low, middle, and high goals, which also receive more points, which is the highest of six points per pollutant or ball in the top and less as you go down. At the end, you get points for parking on the ramp, and you get more points if you hang on the bar in the middle. Yep. And if you've participated in FTC before, you know that this whole parking thing is very similar to some of the games in FTC uh, in the past. Uh, so yeah, you you can probably draw a lot of uh, commonalities between FTC and FRC games and the first global uh, game this year. Definitely, and you had um you had pointed out that uh you thought it was similar to Velocity Vortex and Rover Ruckus, and it definitely ended up being played like that at the competition. You saw a lot yeah. of shooters like from Velocity Vortex, and then some of the best teams were the teams that could actually use a like linear slide and go up and dump and that was also very similar to river ruckus so one a few things about the game that are just rules that weren't mentioned is that there's no limit to how many of the pollutants a robot can hold how many balls a robot can hold so that meant that oftentimes teams would have like 10 20 of them on their robot at a time another thing worth mentioning is that while you may think that it's the best option to score only the small balls, there were many more of the macro balls, the bigger balls, than there were small balls on the field, which made it so you have to trade off whether you were you thought you would be able to actually score as many as you could. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I can speak a little bit about our strategy. Um, early on in the season, when we got the game, we actually decided that we wanted to focus on the micro pollutants, which were the small balls. And kind of looking back on that now, um, if we could go back and do it all over again, I think we would definitely focus on scoring both of them equally um, because we actually had a flicking mechanism uh, with the priority of scoring all the micro pollutants into the highest level of the processing barge. But when we got to the competition, we realized that the best teams you know, they got, um, it didn't matter if it was a big ball or a small ball, they collected them all. And um, almost like the last 30 seconds of the match, they scored, you know, more than 20, more than 10 or even 20 of those balls all in one dump. So that was definitely the winning strategy for this game. Wow. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I think we'll go over some of the top strategies later on in the show. Uh, just a quick recap, there are 191 countries competing in the first global competition this year. And this year's competition was actually held in Dubai uh, late October, which is just a few weeks ago. And we now have a few questions for our guests here regarding the transition from FTC to first global, as it's a pretty big transition. So this year, first global was held at a pretty odd time. It was in October, which is uh, like around a month after kickoff. Right. And... I know that like as a member of Team USA last year, we didn't really have to have that trade-off of work on FTC or work on FIRST Global. And it seems like a pretty hard problem. So how did your team actually balance FTC and FIRST Global? So, so or, uh, just yeah. to start off, um, so it was actually kind of funny because when we got, you know, um, when the game was released and everything, 
during the summer, we actually had like uh, Bryant and I and one other team member actually went to Arkansas Governor School for an entire month. So that was like a month where we couldn't be working on robot. We weren't uh, working on any mechanism, strategy, preparation, anything like that. So Bryant and I missed that experience. Uh, so it definitely gave some more responsibility to other members of our team who aren't usually like responsible, um, aren't like uh, overseeing the entire robot development process during our regular season. But I can definitely say that there are definitely lack of uh, manpower. We usually have a lot more people working on our robot during the regular season. So we had to adapt um, and we especially had some new team members come in during the summer and they did an amazing job of learning quickly how to do, you know, first robotics. So we're extremely proud of them, but it was definitely a challenge. Yeah, we um we used this opportunity also to help some of our rookie members um, learn some of the things about the engineering design process and about the robot and about the control system and things like that. And so we were able to get some rookie members that may have not been able to go to Dubai, but they were still able to help us um, with the robot. And then also during that period, me and Abby were gone. We did that. And then the... Um, the way that we that our team chose who was going to be the five going to dubai that was a, so we did it based on seniority on the team and so me abby and sarah were all founding members of the team so we've been there since day one and then um the t two other people megan and kat they were both they've both been on the team for the longest amount of time after that and so that's how we chose who was going but we also did a lot of fundraising uh, to try to get everyone who was involved in winning the Inspire Award at Houston to get to go to Dubai, even if it was in a volunteer position. So we successfully took everyone on the Inspire Award winning team um, that was still on our team during First Global, and we took them with us. Uh, some as volunteers, actually all of them were volunteers. So it was a very exciting experience and we're happy that everyone involved with that win was really able to celebrate it in Dubai with the five official members as well. Yeah, for sure. That it sounds like an amazing experience you guys had. So um, actually, just to clarify for you guys, um, last year, the first global competition was held, I think, in August. Uh, this year was held in late October. That's why the huge uh, t like difference in time frame uh, threw some people off. Yeah, it definitely, and uh, you know, now that we're done with First Global, you know, we even think that our team, you know, we're working as hard as possible to get uh, as ahead as we can for our first qualifier. So, you know, even though we had an amazing time in Dubai, we're definitely going to remember it for the rest of our lives. We are definitely shifting priorities now to making sure that our robot, our engineering notebooks, and our judging is all ready for this season, which is actually going to be the last season for a lot of our team members, because a lot of our team members are actually seniors this year. So mm. we're trying to go out with a bang. <laughs> Do you feel like you're a little bit behind this year in FTC just because of the first global? For sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> so much of our efforts, especially with ex experienced team members, were specifically on first global because we had gotten pretty behind there also. And so it was, um, it's, it's definitely been getting back. It's been a struggle. We're still, working really hard. We worked at an extra meeting today just to just so we can try to catch up before our first competition. Yeah, another thing that like, you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of like seniors on FRC and FTC teams can relate to is, you know, a lot of us are all actually trying to get into college as well and like plan our futures. So that's kind of important. But we also had to build like two robots for the past couple of months. So it was a very stressful experience. Um, but, you know, we're happy we did it, but, you know, now we're shifting all of our focus to try to be as competitive this year, so. Oh, yeah, I can imagine. It's just, it's hard <laughs> enough building one robot and building two. <laughs> yeah, trying to get everything to on college. top of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so another thing is, what was your transition like from building an FTC robot to building a first global robot? Because th there's a lot of difference between them, because first global robots, you're limited to that one kit of parts, and I know that your team... Uh, uses a ton of custom parts on your actual first FTC robot. So how did you go through that transition? What were some of the difficulties you faced in that? So, so I think timeline-wise, um, our, our team actually spent a lot more time in the prototyping phase than we ever did any season um, during FTC. So because we were constrained to that kit of parts, we wanted to make sure that we had 
You know, we tried, tested as many configuration of shooters. I know we tried flywheel shooters, we tried flickers, and, you know, we wanted to make sure that we made the most informed decisions with what we had in the kit of parts. Yeah, and it was definitely a new experience for our team to work with a kit of parts because except for our first year, we've almost done all of our robot custom. And so that was definitely different and we definitely struggled with also not only being limited to what parts you could use, but also how many of them. Okay. Uh, the um, kind of a funny story is the last day before, or two days before we left for competition, we realized that um, we had 11 master links on our robot when you're only allowed 10. And we like we knew they probably weren't going to check, but we still wanted to make sure we were abiding by the rules. And so we had to we had to redo some some chain for that. And so yeah, another fun fact was uh, actually all of uh, the kit of parts came in like this plastic container, and uh, we decided that we wanted to make our like main mechanism, our flicking mechanism. We wanted the flicker part. Uh, to be made out of the plastic from that container. And we didn't realize that it was illegal to use plastic from that container uh, about um, till a week away from Dubai. So we also had to make some like pretty significant changes uh, to some of our mechanisms, you know, just like whenever it came into crunch time and we were counting, you know, how many parts we needed to be legal. Um, but I will say there is definitely a lot of flexibility when it came to legality of parts at the competition. So I don't know if we would have, we should have worried about it as much as we did, but um, yeah. 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 And, and that's during the FTC competition season that you guys were replacing and changing up all your attachments. So that's right. a lot of crazy work. Yeah. And FTC is definitely like so much more strict about like inspection and things like that, which we weren't really um, expecting because, you know, at FTC, you know, if you don't fit, a, fit in that sizing box or you have one too many components, then you can't compete. But at first global, I think they were trying to get as many teams to compete as possible, you know, no matter what they had. So it ended up being OK. Yeah, so we never we actually we never passed um, control inspection at Dubai. They never. Um, so when we uh, we had our we had one of our we had our control hub die about halfway through working. And so we bought a yeah. new one just from Rev. And but as but that control hub came with the FTC SDK or yeah, SDK on it instead of the first global one. And since the global one isn't public this year, we um we had our, we just kept our FTC SDK on it and it's that ended up um that wasn't allowed but then they're like oh it'll probably be okay and the inspectors <laughs> never came back and so we never got our sticker for control inspection but they let us play so that's yeah it didn't matter <laughs> yeah uh so moving on I, I I know uh a few questions about Dubai it's competition we're already on that topic is do you feel how is your experience in Dubai and also like do you feel like the robot side of the competition was taken more seriously than in an FTC because like I know this is something that like is like a big thing in th about first global that everybody thinks about it is that like the robot doesn't matter I want you to I want to know from you do you guys feel like it was actually taken like really seriously or was it just like a side part of it for the actual experience yeah. I'll, uh, so on your so on your first question about Dubai in general, so first of all, the facilities were amazing and everything was super nice there. The hotels were great. And so that was that was an awesome experience. We didn't get to do a ton of sightseeing because our uh, our flight, it's kind of a long story, but we ended up flying out of Houston instead of Dallas. And so we <laughs> had to take a bus from the Dallas airport to the Houston airport. And then we, were, we ended up being about eight hours late. So all of our sightseeing <laughs> time kind of got eaten up by that. But <laughs> the city was great and amazing. And then on, um, on, your, on the side of the robot things, I think in general, the competition was less like competitive everyone was there just to meet new people have a good time it was a lot of collaboration things like that and so it was i would say it was less competitive in that sense but i would also agree with you that it was more focused on the robot than judging than ftc is there were judging because judging happens all in the pits in first global and you only get like maybe 10 15 minutes with the judges and so there can be a lot of 
discrepancies in judging. So people were definitely very focused on what the robots were doing and who was the highest ranked in the robot game and things like that. Brent, I, I, I got to ask you a question real quick. Um, How long was yeah. Dean's speech? So Really short. It was the <laughs> shortest I've ever heard. So that's true that his speech during opening ceremony was very short. And then his closing ceremony speech, most people weren't there for because they had people start unloading after the robot game ended. And that was while he was speaking. So like, we didn't even get to like hear him speak because we were unloading all of our stuff back to the buses while he was speaking. So mm -hmm. I thought the order of events there was a little bit interesting, but yeah. Nice. Well, that's really good to hear. So um, another thing that I would like to point out uh, for some that you don't, some of you that don't know, uh, FD uh, first recently re um, reduced the number of uh, the minimum number of teams required to qualify uh, from a region uh, down from two to one. So some of the some of the competitions uh, this year, like state some of the state championships and stuff, um, they're only sending one team to Worlds, which means that that's only the Inspire winning team. So that's that sort of prompted the question that. Um, First, just sort of shifting their focus more towards awards and maybe like intuitively less away from robots. So that's why uh, we were going into the depths of um, why First Global might be focusing more on robots. Uh, so that was an interesting comparison between the two um, that that's happened recently. Uh, so next, and I think we're going to. One gonna... thing I would like to add to that was, yeah. uh, you know, at the event. There is also, even though it's a requirement that one person on every team had to speak English, there is definitely still a language barrier there. And you could tell that the one thing that everyone could really bond over and easily understand was the robots, you know? So I think that's also why you know, they didn't have a big focus on judging or awards, because really the one thing everyone was there for that everyone could agree on was the robotics tournament. So I do think it was emphasized a little bit more than people here tend to think. Yeah, and that's and that's really a great way to bring that international community together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think so, next, yeah, next we're gonna go a little bit into the competition. Uh, so we're gonna get into a little bit of some of the match play that went on uh, during the competition itself. Uh, the winning alliance of the competition was composed of uh, teams Belarus, uh, Moldova, Norway, and Team Hope. Uh, the finalist alliance was made up of teams Israel, uh, Italy, Australia, and Team Uganda. And, so it was great to see. Yeah. Uh, so Team Hope is uh, actually refugees. So it's one of the special things that First Global does is they have a yeah. team comprised of only refugees. And their, their stories are just great. If you ever have the chance to talk to them and go to a First Global competition, they're one of the teams you always want to meet. Yeah. And Absolutely. so it... In First Global, there's also judged awards, with the Albert Einstein Award being the most prestigious of the awards. So this is essentially the equivalent of the Inspire Award, for example. And so the third place went to Team Germany, and the second place went to Team Tunisia, and the winner went to Team Guyana. So now we're just going to go over a few of the matches. So we're going to go over first qualification match 232, which was one of Team USA's best qualification matches. And so, let's see. Asher, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I just, I, uh, I was just, I just want to point out that it's qualification match two thirty two, and that sounds like a huge number. And for the first global competition, actually had a huge number of matches. I think it was in the hundreds. Do you guys know the exact number of matches? I'm not actually totally sure. I, is it two eighty? Yeah. I think that, it was like it was. Do math. Yeah, I think it was like 280 something. Yeah, so there's a crazy amount of matches, and that's because, again, there were like 191 teams there. So it's a huge difference between the scale of the competition from even Worlds to oh, the yeah. first global competition. Yeah. Definitely. So, Abby and Brian, do you guys have anything to just like narrate this match since you guys were uh, with the teams playing? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so our robot's the one on the far side behind the processing barge right now. It's a. Uh... Let's see. Wait. Oh, I lost this. I think they we're all kind of look the same. Hold on. Yeah, they're on the red alliance. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. We're about to shoot right now. So that's ours. So we're gonna shoot our micro pollutants into the top level there. We yeah. probably have like six or seven loaded. That's about how much we got before each section. Every time we had went to shoot. <laughs> um, you can see. Uh, there's a team in the bottom right corner focusing on scoring the macro pollutants into the local. That was um, 
and oh, and now you can see that they're actually using their human player to load them into their robot, where they're gonna lift them up and dump them into the processing barge. And so that was um, some teams were able to do that with the macro pollutants, where they would load them by hand. But then there were also team. There was one team that would um, park on the back wall, and their human player could load macro pollutants in and actually shoot them into the top goal. So there was definitely some very innovative strategies with getting the macro pollutants into the goal compared where most teams for the micro pollutants were either shooting them or then just dumping them at the end of the game. Yeah, and that's, that's, some, that's something uh, very similar to something that you'd see the goal that some teams, uh, the different goals that some teams come into competition with. So you can see like a lot of teams focusing on the, uh, on the macro pollutants. Like you see uh, one team in the bottom right corner actually just dumped a bunch. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, so some teams are really focused on those macro pollutants, just like some teams last year. Uh, maybe towards the beginning of the season, we're more focused just towards cubes or just towards the um, the balls. And that focus on which one you want to go for is sometimes is the deciding factor between which teams win and which teams don't. So that's an interesting decision between which ones are easier to score and which ones give you more points. So, yeah. And now that we're in a in game right here, you'll see teams trying to go and hang up on the bar. There are a lot of teams that were able to do that. And I think we actually hung this match. That was one of the few. Uh, we, we had some trouble with that because we were running our drivetrain on uh, two motors instead of like what we normally do, which is four. Mm -hmm. And um, so our motors were getting hot throughout the match and we were losing traction on going up at the end. So. But. So. What? Oh, so we only had um. so we wanted to run on HD hexes and. So, and since we only had four of those in the kit and we wanted to allocate at least one to shooting mm -hmm. and then, um, oh, and then we had a one other one because we were using an H drive. So that was our, that was our strafe. And so yeah. we, we were out of more HD hex motors. So. Yeah. This year, um, in the first global kit, there are four HD hex motors and then four core hex motors and then six rev smart robot servos. The HD hex motors are have more power, so they're much faster and have a little bit more, they have around more torque and then the core hex motors. So the HD hex motors were often used on the drivetrain. And now let's get into uh, the last finals match, which is the other match that we want to go over. So a few strategies that you're going to see is that right now near the beginning of the match, uh, all the robots go around and just collect balls throughout the whole match. So. Let's um, roll that very soon so you can see all of the pollutants have been distributed throughout the whole field. Mm -hmm. And there was Jim Cameron. You can also yeah. see a lot of robots going over to the other side of the field during the match. And that was a strategy that I would say um, started to come about like near the end of day two mm -hmm. because teams were realizing that if you just let some of the really good teams that could collect a bunch, collect all of them at the beginning of the match, they were just going to dump at the end. And so teams actually started going over to the other side of the field to try to starve their opponents of, especially the micro pollutants. Yeah. Especially since those micro pollutants are a lot smaller, um, they're a lot easier to pick up. So it's easier to pick up a lot more of those. Uh, so when you're able to get that quantity, uh, especially your opponent's uh, micro pollutants, it'd be easier to intake a bunch of those at the same time and sort of hoard them till the end of the match to prevent your opponents from scoring. So that was an interesting uh, defensive strategy we saw. One of the more interesting robots in this match is actually Team Moldova, which is on the right alliance. So you're going to see um, right now they're just focused on collecting stuff and just shuttling balls into the corner. But then later on in the match, you're going to see that they actually have their human player load... Um, the macro pollutants, the big balls, into their robot while they also have intaked a few of the micro pollutants into their robot. So you can see right now in the left hand of the frame, they were just loading them up into the robot. And they're going to go to sh um, put them in, though they're not on the frame right now. And the... And you can see, like, at the score of the match right now, since blue is shooting, they're getting some points kind of throughout the match. But mm -hmm. since red is doing this hoard and then dump strategy, you'll see in the last 30 seconds about here that they're going to get all of their points in just that short amount of time. Right. And so, another aspect of the game that we haven't talked about yet was uh, in this game design, there's actually a cooperation bonus that was a part of this game uh, with the goal that basically if all teams could get all of the pollutants off of the field 
then every team would get an additional like certain amount of points called the cooperation bonus. And there is actually no match in which that occurred during the entire event. Uh, so even during like even with the best teams during the finals, no one got that cooperation bonus and was able to get all the balls off of the field. Yeah. Yeah. And if you can see right now, like both the scores just went shooting up high because the, the red team, especially, they just dumped all their um, pollutants onto the um, into the center vortex at the same time. So that's crazy, like just shot up their score. And again, the hanging thing I really want to emphasize is really, really similar to Rover Ruckus. So you can see a lot of comparisons uh, between um, FTC games and uh, this year's FTC. Yeah. So a few other things. Uh, so the red, the red Alliance eventually won the finals, which was a uh, best of three matches. But you can see that I believe in this match, which is finals match two, to my knowledge, uh, the blue Alliance actually, it's, this is three. Yeah. Um, so this one, the red Alliance won, but some things you're going to notice is that a lot of times teams miss their uh, pollutants from the goal. And so the micro pollutants, especially, you would see that some teams would actually just dump their micro, their macro pollutants into the goal. And then it would, the micro pollutants would just bounce out, which yeah. happened a lot and makes a pretty big difference. For example, I believe some teams, it might've made the difference of a few matches because that top goal is made out of net. And uh, there are definitely some teams, too. Uh, the teams who had the shooters that shot really high, there are, there are several cases throughout, you know, uh, the different competition days where they shot into the other team's um, the scoring. So it was definitely, it required a lot of, some robots required a lot of precision in shooting and things like that. And I, I like how you mentioned the net, because actually, if you look in the reveal video, you'll see that there wasn't a net. Yeah. And I think, and so a little bit throughout the first global season, they actually changed the, the game manual, so that, in, or like the setup guide, so that it included a net. And I, I think that was because teams were noticing that balls were bouncing out too easily when they were shooting them in. Right. Can you guys talk about a little bit on how the playoff structure works for First Global? Because if I remember in previous years, you just kind of randomly got assigned with teams. Was that the same thing for this year? Yeah, it was not the same this year. So this year, um, after all the qualification matches, last year, I believe, teams were ranked based off total points scored. Is that Was that correct? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and so this year it wasn't, it was ranked exactly, or it was ranked like FTC, kind of how people hoped it would be. It was, so it was, ba it was the first um, ranking was your qualification points. So two for a win, one for a tie, zero for a loss. And then your, um, your tiebreaker points were based on how many points your alliance had scored throughout the competition and adding that total up. And then after that, the top 24 teams were put into alliances in, um, in i guess you can call it a so so one was paired with number nine and then two was paired with 10 three was paired with 11 and then the third alliance it kind of snaked or the third partner it kind of snaked back and so that means one was with eight and 24 and then and so they they went through that pattern throughout, and then your fourth alliance partner was completely random out of someone in the competition. So, so and, I got to follow yeah. up on that because that, that's a concern that's been brought up when people have brought up models for things is couldn't they couldn't a team theoretically then manipulate the score to get a certain ranking to be paired with somebody else then? They, I believe theoretically, yes. I don't know if that I don't know if there's yeah. that much thought really put into I mean there could have been but we definitely were not considering trying to do or didn't hear anything about that yeah yeah mm -hmm. so I know like la this this year's is much better like last year's um it was random completely for the playoff matches and it was just an elimination best of one match and you just go up the pyramid but the alliances were completely random so like Number one was paired with like number three, and they just dominated all their matches. Right. This year, it seems a little bit more fair to all the teams. Yeah, and I can also talk a little bit about how the playoff structure works in case anyone wants to rewatch some matches. So, the um, the eight teams competed in a round robin where they each played um, two matches, and then they were ranked off of the same system that the uh, qualification matches were ranked. And then the best, the top four teams after that round robin actually played in another round robin where they each played three matches. 
and then the top two teams from that round robin then played in a best of three in the finals, which is what's being shared right now. Hmm. And I could say one of the highlights, because uh, um, unfortunately we didn't get to play in the elimination matches, but it was just a great experience sitting in the stands, you know, the energy with everyone there, people were like cheering so proudly for their teams. And you saw people from all over the world, like waving their flags and celebration of their team and their alliances as well. So, you know, just sitting back and everyone was definitely on the edge of their seats towards the end of the elimination rounds, but it was just an amazing experience either way. So it was pretty cool. I do have to ask one other question as this goes to a full frame in a second. There's something to me that uh, everybody seems to be missing. Uh, and I'm going to ask you, uh, safety glasses, why aren't these not enforced at first global competition when so uh, they're have... clearly enforced at other first competitions? Yeah, we have we have no idea. We we brought we have team safety glasses and we brought them and we wore them the entire competition. But we saw almost no other team wearing safety glasses. Yeah, the... yet one of the awards giving at the award ceremony was the safety award. And when they <laughs> announced that, they announced that everyone won the safety award, even though like so many You're of like, the teams no one was had wearing no safety, safety glasses. glasses on. Yeah. So um, that was a little suspicious, but yeah. So last year, uh, it was a little bit worse. So one of our <laughs> team members was volunteering on the field as like a score tracker. And so all the, in the game manual, it says, of course, safety glasses are required. But when he was on the field, he said that all the ref folks were like, safety glasses are not required. Because, like, of course, it's not really that dangerous if you have normal glasses. And then the safety award last year was given to many teams who weren't wearing safety glasses yeah. in their pit. <laughs> Everyone got it this year. So I don't really know what that means. And we didn't even get our ribbons. Like everyone got a ribbon for the safety award, and Team USA yeah, never got ribbons. And we actually, yeah, we actually <laughs> wore safety glasses. So I don't you, know. you guys were too safe. That was the problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching. If you want more fun content, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos. You can also directly help support fun by visiting our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash first updates now or by subscribing at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Thank you to all of our co-executive producers keeping fun loud, live, and independent.